Hey, Pastor Brennan here. I just want to say thank you for viewing this video sermon. I hope that you're blessed. If you're tied into a local church and you're viewing this as just sort of extra teaching, that's awesome. I hope you really enjoy it and that you grow spiritually. If you're not tied into a local church, I just want to encourage you to come and maybe visit Crosspoint in person or check out another Christ-centered, gospel-proclaiming church in your area because we believe that everyone should experience the blessing of being tied into a local church. But I hope this video is an encouragement and that it helps you grow in your affections for Jesus Christ. Well, good morning. If you're able, I'll ask you to stand for the reading of this morning's text. We will be in the book of Hebrews this morning. I'll be reading from chapter 2, uh, from verse 10 to verse 18. So that will be Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10 through 18. There is a Bible under the chair in front of you. It's on page 1002 if you'd like to read along. And the text goes as follows. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by all by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise, and again I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not to angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Thank you. You may be seated. May the Lord increase his word this morning. Thank you, Mark. Mine is, my name is Chris Dominich. I am one of the elders here at Crosspoint, and I'm very appreciative of Pastor giving me this opportunity to stand behind this pulpit. I don't take it lightly. I feel the weight of it, and I pray that, pray that I glorify God through this morning. So I want to start with a question. How many of you have or have had a brother or brothers? All right, all right a good number of you in here. Well, many of you know that my brother Dan started to attend Cross Point this year, and we're pretty close. I, we're only 18 months apart. He is older than me. You may not be able to tell from that picture, uh, but he is, eight, he is only 18 months older than me. So, so we've shared a lot of experiences together. And I hope he doesn't mind that I share some of those experiences with you all this morning. I'm hoping you, that those of you who have brothers can relate. And those of you who have never had a brother, perhaps you'll get a taste of what it's like to have a brother. So as I mentioned, we go way back. And starting from family functions, we were partners in crime together. We always sat together, usually on the couch. We like to dress up, especially like on Easter. Uh, we still do that today. And, and that was important for him to be there for me. If you look at that first picture, I had wings. So if there was a strong gust of wind, I was gone. So he had to hold me down, keep me in place. Now, he was also my teammate, and we played Little League Baseball together for years. Every other year, we actually got to play on the same team, and we won several championships together. And that continued into adulthood, young adulthood, uh, playing softball together. He still plays. He's crazy. But, uh, but yeah, we had a great time doing that. But we've also suffered together. We've suffered together for years. <sighs> I always like to say the Lord has taught us humility through being Jets fans. Uh, we have been lifelong Jet fans. Uh, we've never seen a championship, but, but we do love football. And we loved playing football together. I, not formally, but you know, all the kids in the neighborhood used to come to our house. And we used to play football on the front lawn, or maybe we'd go up to the school and play. 
And there was another game we'd like to play. I don't know if my mom's ever going to see this, but it was called Kill the Guy with the Ball. Yes. <laughs> Great game, not the safest game in the world. But we'd play Kill the Guy with the Ball, and my brother was bigger than me, and, and his job after the game was to pick off all the guys, take them up off the pile. And I really appreciated that, because I usually had the ball and was usually at the bottom of that pile. But then the middle school years came, and he became my consoler. See, it was in middle school that our parents got divorced. And I just could not wrap my head around the fact that my dad would no longer be coming home every night for dinner. And my brother was my consoler. Now, I have a great relationship with my dad today, but that was tough. Those were tough years. And then our mom, she became a single mom. So Dan and I, we became the maintenance crew. We had to take care of the house. We had to mow the lawns. We had to take care of our property. We were the maintenance crew, and we did it together. And then we get further along into the college years, and, and, and my brother graduates from college first, and he starts working for a company, and he becomes my advocate when I start looking for my first summer internship. And believe it or not, 31 years later, I'm still working for that same company because my brother was my advocate advocate. You know what? He was also my listener when a few years later I became a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I started believing everything that the Bible had to say. And everyone thought I was crazy in my family, including my brother Dan. But he listened to me and he asked questions. And he even agreed to be my best man when we got married two months later. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. And then finally, he's been my comforter. He was my comforter when our first grandfather died. The same grandfather, my mom's dad, who helped to keep an eye on us. So that was tough. Yet he was my comforter, even as he was wrestling with his own faith. So I'm thankful for my brother, He's helped me through a lot of trials. He's probably kept me th from some trials as well. I'm thankful for him. But can I tell you, there's a verse in Proverbs, Proverbs 18.24, which says, A man may, of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. So whether you have or have had a close friend or brother like that, I want to tell you that there is a friend and brother who is infinitely better than any brother you might have here on earth. And his name is Jesus. And we need him. We need him to make it through this life and to make it successfully to the next one. And we need his spirit to teach us that, to prove that to us. So let's ask for the God's help as we dig into this passage. Our Father, first of all, it is a privilege to, be call, to call you Father. Those of us who have been united to your Son through faith have been granted this privilege. We've been born spiritually into your family. Your Holy Spirit indwells us, and your Son, our Savior, is our brother. These are weighty truths that we cannot understand apart from your Spirit. May he be our teacher as I speak. Help us to grasp what it means to have Jesus as our brother. And may these truths challenge us to look to our brother in times of need and prepare us to be an example like our brother when you give us the responsibility to lead. We ask this in the name of our perfect brother, Jesus. Amen. All right, so let's get into some theology, shall we? If your Bibles are not still open to Hebrews 2, please turn, Hebrews 2, verse 10. Uh, if you had borrowed one of the Bibles earlier, go ahead and grab that from under the seat in front of you again, and you can turn to page 1002. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. This is God's Word, and it is so good. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Boom! I mean, this verse alone 
could take me the rest of the service to unpack. It's so rich, and it really is critical to the rest of the passage. But my job is to keep it short and simple. So I know some of you have just started praying for me again, and I appreciate that. Go ahead and do that. But let's start identifying the he in this verse. All things, and I mean all things, exist for whom and by whom. This is an incredibly important question, folks. Any serious worldview should answer the questions, how did we get here and why are we here? Now, the Hebrew believers reading or hearing this letter would have been familiar with the first book of the Bible, Genesis, and would have known that the he in this verse is God the Father. So how did we get here? All things exist by God the Father. He said, let there be, and there was. All things, galaxies full of stars and planets, heavenly beings, earthly creatures, and the pinnacle of his creation, man and woman, created in his own image. So why? Why are we here? Well, all things exist for God the Father. His creation brings him glory. It shows off his power, his wisdom, his creativity, and all of his other awe-inspiring attributes. So whether you are a believer or a not-yet-believer here today, you need to understand that you have a primary purpose in life, and that is to bring glory to God. Don't ever believe that you have no purpose. You do. We all do. Okay? Our purpose is to glorify God. And if you have not realized that, you've been missing out and probably have realized that something is missing. You're right. You're not fulfilling your purpose in life. So how can we glorify God? Well, I love how the New City Catechism beautifully answers this question. We glorify God by enjoying him, loving him, trusting him, and by obeying his will, commands, and law. <laughs> well, how in the world do we get there? Well, there's a process where God the Father grants many of us faith in his son Jesus. And through the power of his Holy Spirit, God adopts us as sons and daughters. Now, Pastor Brennan is starting a new series next week on adoption, so I encourage you so much to be back here for that. But as sons and daughters of the creator God of the universe, we can enjoy him, love him, trust him, and we actually want to obey his will, commands, and his law. See, God literally brings many of us as his children now into his glory. So now back to your Bibles in verse 10. It said it was fitting that as, as part of that process, our Father made the founder of our salvation perfect through suffering. Now, who is the, the founder? Who is the originator of our salvation? This is not a trick question. The answer is Jesus. And from what do we need saving, this salvation? What do we need saving from? We need saving from God's judgment, from God's wrath. See, when we were not or are not living for God's glory, we regularly disobey his will, his commands, and his law. And as lawbreakers, we deserve God's wrathful judgment. But when we put our faith in Jesus, who he is and what he's done, we are united to Jesus. We become the Father's children and are saved from this wrathful judgment. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, who is Jesus? Well, Jesus is God the Son, one of the three persons of the Godhead. But isn't God perfect? Why would God the Father have to perfect 
God the Son through suffering. Because in place of pouring out his wrathful judgment on disobedient humans, he needed a perfectly obedient human who could take our place. A human who would perfectly glorify God by enjoying him, loving him, trusting him, and perfectly obeying his will, his commands, and his law. And Jesus did just that as an infant all the way to adulthood. You know, it's true. Jesus suffered the most on the cross when he bore the full weight of God's wrath for all those who would believe in him. But he also suffered in every stage of life to become a worthy and perfect sacrifice for me and for every one of you who would believe in him. Whew. I said verse 10 was a lot. <laughs> Let's go ahead and move on to verse 11. Hebrews 2 verse 11. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he's not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. So to sanctify means to be set apart or to be made holy. The Father is our source source of eternal life. And when he connects us to Jesus, and Jesus begins to change us into his own image. And the more we become more like Jesus, the more set apart or holy we become. And because we also come from the Father, Jesus is not ashamed to call all of us believers his brothers and his sisters. And that it's amazing. As believers, believers, Jesus is truly our brother, our best brother. And as our brother, there are things Jesus does for us, his siblings. In verse 12, Jesus becomes our primary worship leader. Now here, in verse 12, Psalm 22 is quoted which is one of the most powerful messianic psalms. It speaks of the Messiah's death and the Messiah's resurrection. And then the resurrected Messiah tells what he will do, which is what he is doing with us. He's teaching us about the Father through song. Now, have you ever pictured our Lord Jesus singing before? You should. As Christ dwells in us and we hear each other singing truths from God's word, Christ is encouraging us and he's teaching us about his father. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. You see, through scriptural worship, we learn how Jesus trusts his Father completely. And as verse 13 states, we see how the gift of his siblings do the same in trusting the Father. So as you're preparing for worship, don't see me up here, or Dane, or Josh, or Jill, or Richard, or Anthony, see Jesus and let him lead you to worship our Father. And that's our first takeaway slash prayer for today. Lead us in worship, brother. Lead us in worship. That would be a good prayer to remember as you enter into worship through song. 
Now let's continue to verse 14. Since therefore the children, it's Christ's siblings, share in flesh and blood, he, Jesus, himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. So this verse, verse 14, references both Christmas and Easter. See, Jesus was born as a human, that's Christmas. He did that to be like us, so that he could be a substitute for us. And that is exactly what we celebrate at Easter, when he died in our place on the cross and rose again, defeating the power of sin, death, hell, and the devil. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> what does the devil have to do with this? Well, back in the beginning, God created this amazing world, and he gave man all things richly to enjoy with one restriction. Genesis 2, 16 and 17 states, And the Lord God commanded the man, Adam, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now the devil, he's an angel, not created in the image of God, and jealous of man and man's worship of God. So he enters into the picture here. And in Genesis 3, 1 through 5, it's recorded that he says to Eve, did God actually say all of that? And then he says, you will not surely die. We see here that the devil first made the woman question God's word, and then he straight out lied to the woman, telling her she would not die so that she would die. And that's what happened. She ate, and she gave to her husband Adam, and he ate. And God judged them, and he cursed them. And rather than killing them on the spot, which would have been totally justifiable, the first death and substitutionary sacrifice recorded in the Bible is God creating, or I'm sorry, is God killing animals he had created and using their skin to cover Adam and Eve. But God would no longer permit Adam and Eve to live forever in this fallen, cursed condition. So he drove them from the garden so that they would no longer eat from the tree of life that was also there and that would have given them the ability to live forever. They would eventually die physically because they gave in to the, te the devil's temptation and disobeyed God. And that's why we die, friends. Our ancestors listened to the devil. They disobeyed God and passed the curse of death onto all of us. And this fear of death, it can be paralyzing. Hebrews 2.15 says that the fear of death is like lifelong slavery. Can you relate to that? I mean, perhaps, like me, you've had a midlife crisis. The number of years in front of you are getting less and less than the years behind you. Or perhaps you've received a medical diagnosis that is causing you to fear for your life. You know, I must confess, I, I learned a new term recently, FOMO. FOMO, F-O-M-O. -O. Any kids here want to tell your parents what that means? FOMO? Fear of missing out. And you know what FOMO, this fear of missing out, it's not just for teens and young adults who are afraid that they're going to miss out on a party or an event, and they'll miss out on that experience for the rest of their lives, and it's going to negatively impact them as people. No. FOMO, 
Parents fear too. Parents, as parents, we fear that we're going to die and we're going to miss out on our kids growing up or on seeing our grandkids get married. Singles may fear that they'll miss out completely on, on a job situation or on marriage or even having kids before their life is over. Couples who are having trouble having children may fear that they will never get to experience that joy together in this life. You know what? Each of these fears and many more can be traced back to the fear of death. The fear that this world is all that there is. And I want to experience all of it before it's over. Just do it because, well, YOLO. You only live once, right? Well, according to the beginning of verse 15, through Christ's death, we're delivered from that fear. Now, have we grasped that? Have we really? Why do we still struggle? Why do I still struggle? I mean, if I could get a little open with you all. Personally, this has been a really challenging year. And I wish I could just sit down or maybe sit down someday over, over a cup of coffee, which I don't drink, but you get the picture, and sit down and tell you my entire testimony. I'd love to tell you that. But let me just tell you quickly that before I became a believer, a true believer in Jesus Christ and started to believe his word, I was not in a very godly relationship. I wasn't. But then God got a hold of my heart. And by his grace, he mercifully saved both myself and my now wife at the same time. And two months later, we got married to make our relationship right before God. I mentioned earlier, my brother Dan, he agreed to become my best man. And the young woman, Joey, who witnessed to my wife was her maid of honor. Planned a wedding in two months. Fellas, I suggest that. Damn. Easy. Two months. But all we could focus on was the reception, the wedding itself. We didn't get to plan a big honeymoon. Actually, we had no money to go on a big honeymoon. Well, guess what? Life happens. And you have a family. We've been blessed with five wonderful children. But we haven't been able to go on that honeymoon. And this year we celebrated our 25th anniversary. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. So this was gonna be the year. We planned it out. We made the reservations. We were gonna go on a Mediterranean cruise. We were gonna start in Barcelona. I've, tra I've traced my ancestry back like 400 years to Barcelona. Then our family migrated to Cuba. And then from Cuba, finally, we, they migrated to the United States of America. So we're going to start in Barcelona. We're going to go to Malta. And we're going to start seeing places that you could read about even in the Bible. We were going to go to Ephesus, like Ephesians Ephesus. But we were also going to see beautiful things. We were going to go to the Greek islands. I so wanted to see a sunset in Santorini and Mykonos. And we were going to go to Olympia. Now, I'm a nerd. I love Greek theology. I, I know it's all fake. I know they're not real gods. But there was a time people believed in these gods. And we were going to go to Olympus. And we were going to just see what that was all about. And then we were going to go to Athens, where Paul preached. And then we were going to end up in Rome, where Paul spent his last days. We were so looking forward to this trip. But as many of you know, this year has been a particular challenge for my wife. She's been struggling medically. And there came a day we had to make that hard decision to cancel that trip. I'll be honest, I don't know if we'll ever be able to reschedule it. The Lord knows. So I was down. I was disappointed. I was sad. But you know what? I had to pick myself up get into God's word, and remember that someday I'll be in glory. Yes. Amen. I'll be 
with the Father in eternity forever. And let me tell you this. There is nothing in this world that you will miss when you are with God in eternity in a world free from sin and from death. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, that you will miss. As the song goes, oh, what a day that will be. But we're still in this world, so we still get phone calls. Even this week, as I'm preparing this message, on Tuesday, I get a call from the dermatologist. I've been waiting for it. And yes, I have pre-cancer, the tip of my nose and a small spot on my leg. Pre-cancer, but you ever hear the C word, it's unnerving a little bit. That was Tuesday. On Wednesday, I spent four hours in the waiting room as my wife was having surgery. Now, praise the Lord, the surgery went well. She's home recovering. Hey, babe, love you. Um, you know, praise the Lord. But this world, it's messed up. It really is. And if this world is all there is, if there is no eternity, a fear of death is very, very reasonable. It's very reasonable. But if you're in Christ, those fears should fade. See, we should understand that we have eternal life with God. Death is defeated. We will live in the new heavens and the new earth with him forever. See, we're not just going to be floating around in the clouds. See, after the devil and his fallen angels are judged and thrown into the lake of fire, a description of God's future creation is given in the book of Revelation. And in the very last chapter of the Bible, it describes in chapter 22, verse 14, blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. We get to eat from the tree of life again and live forever in physical, glorified bodies. This is awesome. See, Christians who grasp this have experienced peace and joy through some of their greatest trials, including death. Any good Christian counselor, hear me, any good Christian counselor should understand fears that stem from a fear of death, and they should be pointing those receiving their counsel to these truths. So if you're struggling with these kinds of fears, run to our brother Jesus. Our next takeaway slash prayer is free us from the fear of death, brother. Free us. We can have peace that surpasses all understanding through the most difficult trials of this life when we no longer fear death. Get a hold of that truth. Grab it. Hold on to it. Make it yours. All right. Let's bring this message home with a reminder of how our brother Jesus helps us each and every day. Verse 16. For surely... It is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become our merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffer, suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Now, some theology again. Who are the offspring of Abraham in verse 16? Well, according to Galatians chapter 3, if you're not familiar with it, go back to that chapter. That's your homework after this. Galatians chapter 3, verses 7 and 29. Abraham's offspring are those who have faith in Christ. Those who become his brothers and sisters. See, Jesus helps us believers. He helps us brothers and sisters. How? He walked in our shoes 
so that he understands our temptations. In the Old Testament, the high priest would sacrifice animals to cover the sins of the people so that they would not die. God first did that for Adam and Eve in the garden, and he did it once for all on the cross, as verse 17 says, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Now, I understand propitiation. It's a big Bible word. Propitiation is a word describing the satisfaction of God's justice. Sin against God is punishable by death, and Jesus took on that punishment for all those who have faith in him and what he did. See, Jesus died for those who would become his brothers and his sisters. And according to verse 18, Jesus did not just suffer at the moment of his death on the cross. So let me ask you, have you ever suffered when resisting a temptation? Oh, that piece of cake. Oh, that piece of cake. I know you've all suffered when resisting temptation. No, I know. You finally gave in. You finally gave in. Imagine a life of resisting temptation every time. The suffering that you would endure resisting the temptation every time. And in two chapters, chapters the writer of Hebrews records, if you want to peek over there real quick, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus was tempted as a young boy, and he resisted. He didn't give in to temptations as a teenager. He suffered as a young man with the same temptation that many of you face daily. And he resisted as a grown man. Thus, as verse 18 concludes back in chapter 2, he is able to help those who are being tempted. And that's our last point, slash prayer, slash plea to our brother. Help us. Help us resist temptation, brother. See, we're still in the flesh. And we will be tempted daily. We should want to love Jesus well and obey him, but we need his help to do that. And he often helps us through his other brothers and sisters. There are many brothers here who are such an encouragement to me. They pray for me. They call me. They write me. They text me, even this morning. And they're such a blessing. Because we are united to Christ, our Christian siblings can often be closer to us than our biological siblings. See, we have the same purpose in life, and yet we understand it. We understand our purpose is to glorify God. And I can't tell you how much of a blessing it is when a biological brother becomes a spiritual brother, a brother in Christ. See, it was an amazing privilege to baptize my brother Dan and then to covenant with him together as members here at Cross Point. And we try to get, to get together at least once a month. We did it this past Friday. And we share our experiences as Christian husbands, Christian fathers, employees, managers, ministry leaders, and maybe most importantly, struggling sinners who need to be reminded that we have been saved by grace. And that we both now have a better brother who can lead us, free us, and help us. At this time, I'm going to ask the worship team to, to come back on stage. And I want to also point out that we'll have members of our prayer team up front. For the ladies to my right, 
to the men over here on my left. And please come forward if you need Brother Jesus to lead you to worship properly, to free you from the fear of death, or to help you to resist temptation. And let me end by praying for everyone right here, right now. Oh, our Father, I know there are not yet believers here that are not yet your spiritual children. I ask you to give them faith and adopt them into your family. Lord, thank you for our brother Jesus. May he help us to worship in spirit and in truth. And many of us live in constant fear, fear of missing out, fear of death. May Jesus once and for all free us from these fears. We all struggle also with daily temptations. We know that to sin is unloving to you and unloving to Jesus who suffered, bled, and died because of the same sins we're committing. Help us to resist temptations and to be transformed more and more into the image of our brother Jesus. And it's in his name I pray. Amen. Amen.